Okay, once again, a very, very good afternoon, very distinguished participants and members of the Society of Petroleum Engineers Abuja section. We want to say a warm welcome, a warm welcome, and thank you for joining us here today on our February monthly technical session. Of course, this technical session for today is themed carbon capture utilization and storage in Nigeria, feasibility, challenges, and opportunities. Of course, today we would be listening to amazing and experienced professionals who know so much on carbon capture utilization. You can see on my screen, and today would be quite an interesting day. Can you understand that this session is live streamed on YouTube, so you can always go back to rewatch and rewatch. On my screen, as you can see, is we have um, the safety brief. We'll take a slow down and by 6.30. So once again, I want to say a warm welcome to everybody that have joined today. I will start by saying a warm welcome to, of course, the section chairperson of SP Abuja section. I'd like to say a warm welcome to Madam Amina Danbadami. Thank you for joining us here, ma'am. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you very me. much, Apple. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Okay, we're still here. We have the moderator for this session here present. He's a lecturer at Base University of Nigeria, Abuja, Dr. Kalachi Umehia. A warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Okay, of course, still on this meeting, we have three amazing speakers. Of course, they will do justice to carbon capture utilization and storage in Nigeria. Speaking of which, we have the Senior Special Assistant to the National Program Manager, Energy Transition and Environment Office of the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Dr. Victor Usu, here present. Welcome to you, sir. Thank you for joining us here today. Thank you very much, um, Abraham. Thank you. And really nice to be here with everyone today. Thank you so much. And of course, the only lady we have who is a speaker today. She is a professional postdoctoral scholar, Stanford Center for Carbon Storage, Dr. Rita Okorafo. Warm welcome to you, ma'am. Thank you very much. We also have the Consultant Sustainability and Climate Change Unit, Prince Waterhouse Coopers INC, Dr. Mohammed Aminu. A warm welcome to you, sir, and thank you for joining us here today, sir. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Okay. While participants are still joining, we want to say thank you for joining us. We also have several council members from the SPE Nigeria Council. Online, we can see that the council secretary, Mrs. Fanyama Okoli, is here present. Thank you so much for joining us here, ma'am. We also have Abdul Rafi, who is the alternate secretary for SPE Abuja section. Thank you for joining us here today. We also have engineer. Rume Ogolo, who is a student, who is our YP chair for SPE Abuja section. Thank you for joining us here today, sir. Also here on the meeting, we have Dr. Kafayat Adeyemi, who is the student affairs chair for SPE Abuja section. Thank you for joining us. We can see Professor Chidi Ibe. We can see several other fellows of the SPE. Thank you. Thank you for joining us here today. Switching gears immediately. About safety, so very quickly. Also this event, we advise that if you're not speaking, you kindly mute your microphone, kindly mute your microphone. So as not- um, Please, uh, we have fail. also, hello, Apan, we have two okay. distinguished members. We have um, the chairperson of executive board of Nigeria Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission online. And we okay. also have Professor Chidi Ibe online. Okay, thank you so much, section chair for informing me of that. We'd like to say a warm welcome to the chairman executive board, Nigeria Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission, Mr. Issa Mudibo. A warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you for joining us here today, sir. And also here we have the Professor of Oceanography and the Blue Economy, Professor Chidi Ibe. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. We have over 51 participants, and of course, as the names of very distinguished fellows come to me, I will recognize you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for taking our time to join the SP Abuja monthly technical meeting. Okay, so we go back to our safety brief. We go back to our safety brief. Please, if you're not speaking, kindly endeavor to mute your mic. And if you want to speak, you raise your hand. And of course, the moderators, the co-hosts on call, will give you the access to speak. We know we are in the COVID-19 period. Please, if you are outside, wear your face mask, observe social distancing, use the sanitizers, and of course, observe all of the COVID-19 protocols. We also believe that if you are home, please don't carry your device, your mobile device to your kitchen so as not to have an explosion. Of course, use your phone in the living room and don't carry it to the kitchen. And the last of the safety brief, if you're driving, if you're listening to this session while driving, we know it's very interesting. Kindly endeavor to park your car at a safe space, listen, and after the lecture, you can keep on driving. I believe with this, we will have a very successful deliberation today. Very distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen at this juncture, would like to kickstart this event by having a welcome address by our leader, our amiable mother, the mother of the section, the section chairman, Vice Speaker Abuja section, Madam Amina and Madam Imam, please, the future stage is yours. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It is my privilege and great honor on behalf of SPE Abuja section to welcome all of you. And we really appreciate your taking time out of your busy schedules to attend this very important program. I'd like to thank um, the chairperson of um, executive board of um, Nigeria Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission for joining. He's also a member of SPE, a very serious member at that. We have Professor Chidi Ibe, my mentor, my lecturer, who is also online. Thank you so much. And we have a lot of people from Nigeria Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission, um, engineer Chidima, Odafe, I see you all. Thank you very much for all the support I'm getting from my organization. And I'm sorry, I'm like being partial here. Thank you very much. So SPE is committed to providing valuable knowledge and services to members and um, members of the industry as it concerns the exploration, development, production of oil and gas resources and related technologies. So in that regard, we bring you this program to educate us and to, um, to educate us on carbon capture, utilization and storage in Nigeria on the feasibility, the challenges and the opportunities. And we know that climate change is real. Why is this important? Climate change is real. We see it in the flip-flop weather that we notice. According to my son, he calls it the flip-flop weather because sometimes in one whole day, you see all the four different seasons. You know, and we know that most importantly, the oil and gas industry is the source of about two thirds of the global um, greenhouse gas emissions. So it, of course, um, um, the the sector the sector of oil holds the key to averting the worst effects of climate change. Therefore, we have to find ways of reducing the annual gas flood by the industry. We have to, we are the ones that will provide the solution to that. And this is one of the key things that we can do. So we thank our speakers for accepting to speak. I mean, this is a very important um, topic. We thank Mr. Victor, we thank Rita, we thank Dr. Aminu for accepting to speak. We thank Kelechi for accepting to moderate this program. And I promise you that it's going to be a very exciting, educative and enriching program. So sit tight and take note of questions as the lectures go on. Thank you very much once again for joining us. Thank you, thank you, thank you, section chair for that warm welcome address. Of course, we heard from her. That's of course combating climate change, reducing carbon dioxide 
emission is the main focus and the main reason why we have carbon capture utilization and storage in Nigeria. At this juncture, of very distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to hand over this session to the man who I'll call him the guru in carbon capture. He did his PhD in carbon capture and storage in energy generation. I'm more dread talk for today. A lecturer at Bayes University of Nigeria, Abuja. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome your moderator for today, Dr. Kalachi Omohia. Sir, please, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, it's 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 actually pronounced Omohia. But... Hello, can everyone hear me? Loud and clear. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Um, um, ba based on what um, um, Ms. Amina said, she's actually right. It's um, very important. It's a very important thing um, globally, not just in Nigeria, to combat um, climate change. And carbon capture and storage, um, well, carbon capture utilization and storage has shown, uh, is shown and highlighted as the most efficient way of doing it right now. Do you know what I mean? Because we can, the process allows you to retrofit current existing conventional systems, that is fossil fuels, using coal or um, natural gas, and mitigating the emissions from this, mostly the greenhouse gas um, emissions. That is, you know what the greenhouse gases are, mitigating those substances from current conventional systems. Um, today, we actually have three... Um, three professionals, I would say, three very, very um, high-level professionals. The first one is Dr. Victor Osu. He's the senior, they are going to give us talk, but they're going to obviously walk us through different um, the policies and how carbon capture can be implemented in Nigeria. Um, Dr. Victor Osu, like I was saying, is the senior special assistant to the National Program Manager, Energy Transition and Environment in the office of the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Um, he's a consultant and, and obviously, like I said, senior special assistant on energy transition. Um, currently, he's facilitating the development of a national strategic roadmap for CCUS implementation under the auspice of the energy transition leadership in the office of the vice president. Previously, he was an embedded energy consultant for the Heinrich Ball Stephen Foundation and monitoring experts for GIZ in the Rural Electrification Funds Directorate of the REA, that is the Rural Electri Electrification Agency in Nigeria. Additionally, he has led and supported the Federal Ministry of Environment on se several key climate change actions and activities, including coordinating the development of Nigeria's energy transition plan framework in 2021. Dr. Osu has a master's degree in energy management and a PhD in energy transition and climate governance, both at the Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen. I would like to give Dr. Victor Osu the stage to talk to us about um, CCUS. Thank you very much, um, Doctor. And also, once again, thank you all, um, SPE, for having me here. Um, I would now try to show, share my screen with everyone and then um, start the presentation. Okay, so. Um, Ultimately what, ultimately, what I'll be sharing or discussing today is um, the strategic context for CCUS development in Nigeria. And, and this is because um, right now we have a relationship and a partnership that will, sorry, yeah, my, my video, I need to get that on. Can everybody see me? Yes, I believe so. So um, th this is because right now we have um, a partnership and collaboration with the World Bank and IFC to drive CCUS development in Nigeria. So um, what I'll be highlighting more is the strategic context for developing that and what that means to Nigeria. I'll start by um, giving a bit of the content where we are going to talk about the context and the opinions. And then what actually is this carbon capture in Nigeria, the sectors, the emission sources and any existing developmental works that have been, you know, uh, done in Nigeria, and then we will look at what are we, what is the CCUS work plan and the output, and finally the stewardship. That's progress to date and next steps. Um, 
I'll quickly talk about the context and the underpinning. Now, the context and the underpinning is basically why are we going through this? Why are we looking at CCUS? Now, basically, it started off from this um, from the COP um, Committee of Practice, um, Climate Change Committee of, um, of Practice, um, and then going into the Paris Agreement 2015, where the national determined contribution was actually um, undertaken by. Um, all, most of the countries in the world, all, all the countries in the world. And for Nigeria, it was a very great commitment whereby five sectors um, were looked at. Um, the energy sector where you can you have the power and the oil and gas, the industry sector, agriculture, and transport. Now, after that, within the context of Paris Agreement is what we call the low-term low emission strategy, in, in where we have to look at how do we decarbonize our economy over the next um, 20, 30 years, that's mid, mid century 2015, 2050. In that phrase or in that term, we also started looking at what we call, I mean, why we had to revise our NDC 2021 revision. Now, going within that context, we started having again, the energy transition and net zero pathway. And, and this is the pathway towards transformation of global energy sector to low carbon emissions to net zero. And that net zero is called the deep decarbonization target by 2060. Now, I know a lot of people, um, a lot of us here understand that it's meant to be 2050, the mid century, but Nigeria committed to 2060 um, during the COP26 down here um, at, at Glasgow. Now, within that frame for Nigeria, what we looked at was uh, within the frame of energy transition, what we, did, what we did was to look at what 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 will be the pathways or the climate scenarios to drive us to that 2060. So we looked at business as usual. We looked at the NDC scenario and this was based on the NDC 2021 revised commitment and where we had 47% um, percent for uh, international support and 23, 20, 20, 20, 2023 for um, uh, local, I mean, using our local um, resources to drive that process. Now, in that means, that, in that way, we also looked at the deep, the, the deep decarbonization pathway to net zero by 2060, and that is where the CCUS comes into play. Well, we see that you see CCUS playing a major, major, uh, ma major part in driving Nigeria's um, energy transition and net zero by 2060. Now, um, we looked at again. The, the, when you consider CCUS, you consider a lot of areas where it's applicable. But for today, because it's the petroleum industry, we're looking at the oil and gas, where um, that word just transition becomes um, a common feature for the oil and gas. Now, the oil and gas, um, or the oil and gas industry is very, very strong in Nigeria. I mean, we all understand what the um, and how it's the main budget source, and also mm -hmm. the, the, the foreign exchange earning. I mean, predominantly more than eighty percent for Nigeria. So, I mean, when countries or developing partners or developing world is saying, cut out everything on oil and gas, it means you're trying to say Nigeria will not grow sustainably uh, in terms of economic development. But that that becomes a problem. And because Nigeria is committed to climate change, uh, the, ND, the, the Paris Agreement, it was really important for us to look at it in this way. We will continue to drive our natural resources, oil and gas, but at the same time, we will commit to to um, 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 deep decarbonization, energy transition. And that is why, again, I said, um, the CCUS comes into play. And drivers on the pinning the CCUS, one is the Petroleum Industry Act, the Nigeria Economic Sustainability Plan. I've given an example on why all these acts becomes, all these drivers becomes very important. For example, if you look at the Petroleum Industry Act, you see that there is a mandate to increase our oil production while stimulating the gas market development. You also look at the methane emission reduction commitment, 60% by 2030. And all these cannot be achieved because we will continue to produce our oil and gas, but we need pathways to reduce that emission coming from the oil and gas um, sector. So CCUS in Nigeria, a crucial role is going to play in one, reducing direct emission from sources below. F the first one, the power sector. Second one, the upstream value chain of the oil and gas sector. Um, then also the hard to decarbonize sector. So we're looking at um, industry facilities within associated cement, chemical, oil, iron, and steel production. And again, the oil refineries, downstream value chain of the oil and gas sector. 
Now, the question is, are there any related experience or existing developmental works uh, or data? Sure. Uh, Enhanced oil recovery is not the first, it's not, it's not, it's not new to us right now, but um, so that's an experience that we have going forward that will support CCUS. Uh, data, yes, uh, they're, they're, they're kind of data, and, and I call these data theoretical data, where we see, um, for, for example, uh, my, my, my colleague, um, Dr. Mohamed and team, they did a fantastic job on, on CCUS um, um, development in Nigeria, where they identified key six sedimentary basins, including Niger Delta basins, and also there were um, opportunities or there were um, projects, and uh, again, theoretical projects that was done by, I think, the um, the climate actions of the oil and gas, uh, where four potential storage hubs, Lokoja, Lagos, Podakot, and Kaduna as a, a, a potential storage, uh, storage hub. So you get to see that there are existing stuff or existing um, works that actually are there to, to support CCUS. Now, what are we envisioning in the CCUS program within Nigeria? As I did mention, there are, we already have a partnership with the World Bank Group to see how we can drive that CCUS. But again, um, I just want to be clear here that the, the World Bank Group is going to support in scoping and diagnosis, but the pilot is not going to be focused in the oil and gas sector. So it's clear that I need to explain that. But whatever, the, but the work, the initial work that is going to be done will support um, the oil and gas sector to start developing their energy transition pathway um, and also integrating CCUS as, as a key um, technology and innovation to support that energy transition. So um, what are we looking at within the CCUS work program? Uh, four key activities that or interventions that we are, we, are, we, are, we are currently considering. The first one is technical assessment, where we'll be looking at Nigeria's potential to um, the, uh, the, the, the emission sources and the storage resources, including industrial hubs. We'll also be looking at the emission points and also taking what we call the initial prefeasibility assessment and a pilot for commercial scale uh, in future. We're also going to be looking at a legal and regulatory framework, and, and this is really important because what it will do for us is it will support, it will look at existing laws and regulations that for CCUS and also support the development of the, uh, of the legal framework that will drive CCUS development. We'll also be looking at stakeholders engagement, and I, and I, and I want to believe that today um, it's also, um, I can put this uh, in context that today's forum is part of that stakeholders that we are trying to, you know, um, get them to attention that CCUS is, is, is a project that is coming to Nigeria very soon. And we'll, we'll be engaging with several folks um, down the line uh, on how to go towards that path and achieve a sustainable uh, CCUS development. Capacity building becomes very also important. And I know within this place, we have um, great institutions, um, um, universities, um, training institutions that are gonna be supporting that capacity building and also ministries and agencies of the, gov of the government. Um, now, what is the proposed output of that, of this CCUS workshop? Now, it's, it's to optimize and reduce the cost of CCUS development and deployment in, in the country through development of a national strategy implementation pathway and the prospect for economic value add. Um, value add. And now, this includes what? We'll be having a policy and legal and regulatory framework that enables and supports CCUS development and deployment. Now, key policies that we'll be looking at is carbon pricing, which is gonna be very key, especially for the oil and gas industry to get in, into that, um, that whole picture. Grants, uh, potential grants, um, internal and external grants, operational subsidies and regulatory and standard obligations. And again, innovation research and development. And this is very key because um, without innovation research and development, we can actually achieve that strong sustainable development of, of CCU. Now, another key output that we want is the public acceptance of CCU. CCUS. Maybe this is another debate, you know, for another time whereby we see people thinking CCUS will advance oil um, further emission for, um, from the oil and gas sectors or the coal industry. Now, also investment and CCUS center of excellence. And this is really very important for us. And this comes from the, uh, from the platform of innovation, research and development where um, a CCUS center of excellence will be developed in Nigeria as part of that um, CCUS strategy that we are, we are looking to incorporate into the country. 
Now, I think one, one fundamental thing that is really, really important is not just it's not about the storage, because a lot of times we look at storage and that's the and that's the end, but there's a lot of economic value of CO2 or CCUS broadly. Now, first of all, you look at we, we know we're gonna capture this, right? And, and when we capture it, what, what happens? We, we 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 store it down there. But again, if you look at what it can do, so that's what we call the fuel transformation of CO2, and that is a value economic economic add-on that Nigeria is looking at. So we're not just only going to store, but we are going to utilize that free, uh, the, 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 the CO2 or the CCUS to drive further economic development. Importantly, we are going to be looking at hydrogen production. It's, that's the blue hydrogen. And now the discussion is already on um, in that leg with the United States to see how they can support while we're developing the CCUS, how do we support hydrogen production from that? Not just about storing it, but driving that process. So we also look at methanol production. Now, within the context of methanol production, we're going to be looking at ammonia, the blue ammonia, which is really, really, which is really, really significant for the shipping industry. And, and then other forms of industrial use, like the breweries, where they use the CO2, in most of the drinks that we do, that we drink, you see that carbon um, CO2 is part of it. So there's a lot of um, economic value for not just storing, but driving, but using the CO2 captured to drive economic development. Now, in that, uh, what is the stewardship as at today, progress to date? 10th, 10th of September 2021, we had we had a workshop in partner with International Energy Agency on the prospect of CCUS development in Nigeria. I'm sure a lot of you folks were part of that of that project. And, in, and then leading to that, after that, we had COP26, where two in two events, Nigeria presented uh, in two events. Uh, one was carbon capture and storage in emerging economy, and the second was carbon and capture and decarbonization of a industry in non Annex One and Annex and and, and non and next one. Nigeria also was part of it. Now, in the final phase of our stewardship, we are, as I said, when I started this conversation, we are already in, 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 in a very, very um, high state whereby our development partners uh, will be driving what we call industrial CCUS projects in Nigeria. That should start in quarter two, 2022. And so, of course, as I said, a lot of you guys will be met uh, as part of that stakeholders, uh, stakeholders to support us um, in that project. Now, finally, what is the role of the Office of the Vice President? I think that's a lot of questions that a lot of people are asking that, okay, is there, um, uh, what's the role of Office of the Vice President? Now, uh, in a nutshell, and I said, in a nutshell, a summary, the role of the Office Vice President is, 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 is three things. One, one is to spearhead the CCUS strategic strategy development through robust stakeholders engagement, which is part of this we're doing then is to ensure that CCUS strategy is in line with Nigeria's broader energy and climate policy. And thirdly, to create that condition that stimulates private investment while addressing the challenges that, uh, that we see in CCUS. And I believe that my co-colleagues will talk more about those challenges in the course of this program. So I just want to say thank you again, and um, hope that um, in future, I will meet some of you um, towards the projects that we are driving with under the World Bank Group. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Victor. Um, that was a very, you kept to the time, and that was a very learned, um, learned conversation, I would say. I have a few questions. Obviously, we'll keep the questions to the end of the of the webinar. So, so we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you and thank you again. No worries. So, thank you too. The next speaker that I would like to call is Dr. Rita Isuru Okoro Afo. Am I right? Yes, Okoro Afo. She's a postdoctoral scholar in the Stanford Center of, uh, for Carbon Storage. Very, very top tier, I would say. Very top tier. Um, before embarking on the PhD at Stanford University Energy Resources and Engineering Department, where she investigated optimal ways of harnessing and enhanced geothermal systems, Dr. Okura for was a principal reservoir engineer with Slum Beige. She has 13 years of oil and gas experience in several roles and locations. Dr. Okurafo is an avid SPE and geothermal rising volunteer. She was a recipient of the SPE Africa Region Reservoir Dynamics and Description Award in 2017, SPE International Young Member Outstanding Service Award in 2016, and SPE 
African Region Young Member Outstanding Service Award in 2014. Dr. Okorafo started out her SPE journey as a student member of SPE Uniport chapter, holding the roles of secretary and vice president in different years. She later went on to serve in the SPE Section 103 board in various capacities before moving to Lagos, where she joined SPE Section 61. Dr. Okorafo is currently a member of the Geothermal Rising Board of Directors and a member of Women in Hydrogen. She is known for her excellent mentorship and time management skills. She's an author of two novels and is married with children. Wait, at least October 2021. Thank you very much for, for participating in this webinar and we look forward to hearing, to listening to what you have to tell us, to the lecture. Thank you very much, SP Abuja, for um, this opportunity to share about carbon capture, utilization, and storage, and its feasibility challenges and opportunities for Nigeria. I will be sharing my screen. Um, so give me a second to do that. OK. And I want to thank um, Dr. Victor Osu for that um, very powerful talk, which I think he covers uh, most of what I, what, what I was going to say. <laughs> But, but let's let's see. So what, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to start by not assuming that all of us here know about what CCS is and just provide a bit of context. And then I'm going to talk about um, what we see globally. As most of you know, I'm currently, um, what, what I do now is to, I'm involved in projects related to site selection um, for carbon storage. I'm also involved in what are the different pathways we could take for decarbonizing the economy, um, be it transport, be it um, um, the industry, the power industry, ETC. So there are different pathways. And then ultimately how we bring in our um, subsurface knowledge to try to select um, appropriate sites. I'll talk about that. And I'll also talk about um, what we see in Nigeria from my own perspective and not just about challenges, but the opportunities and what we all can do. Um, I'm very, very happy to hear from Dr. Sue what is being done and the tremendous progress that Nigeria has made. And I believe that we are on the path, why the, um, why the right path to, towards um, decarbonization. So in a nutshell, what is um, carbon capture utilization and storage? And here I put this value chain where we start with collecting um, carbon dioxide from emitting sources, which could be um, power um, generating sources. It could be industries such as ammonia um, generation um, industries. We get these things like the, the CO2. We then have to transport it from the source because we are capturing it. We can't keep it there. We move it, we, are tra we transport it through different methods, most often pipelines. Um, under high pressure, and then we take it to the points where it is either utilized or stored. So this is what the value chain is in general. And then in terms of CO2 by emission, um, something that Dr. Dr. Um, also mentioned was that we may not necessarily be starting with the oil and gas industries for the CCS projects. And there is a reason why. The thing is because you want to um, you want to start your projects where you have high concentration of CO2 in the emission source, such that the energy required to, um, to, to carry out that project is not huge. You have high concentration. And on this sheet, I show um, on, on the right that things like hydrogen and ammonia production have high concentration of CO2 in the exit fluid or the waste fluid. Um, things like cement is also on the high side. On the other hand, things like um, the, the um, natural gas turbines and steam processing, even the, the natural gas turbines, they do not emit as much as all these other processes. So it is usually better to start with high emitting um, um, industries. Where, where in, in Nigeria, for instance, we have things like the cement industry that is a high emitting one. In terms of capture technologies, there are three main things. And the reason why I want to talk about it is such that as we move further in my slides, I don't want you to look at something and not understand what I'm talking about. And there are three main um, ways in which we try to capture 
um, CO2, which is carbon dioxide. One of them is pre-combustion. And that is before we actually use the, the, um, the fuel um, to turn a gas turbine, we capture the carbon dioxide. So pre-combustion, before we carry out the combustion, we collect the CO2. And this is usually seen in things like a gasifier, which is used for coal power plants. Um, and you will hear what's like the IGCC, which is the Integrated Gasification Combined Cycle Power Plant. There's also the method of oxy combustion. And what uh, we're trying to achieve here is before I mix my fuel with my oxygen in the boiler, I want my oxygen to have very high purity so that when I mix, when I, when I extract my CO2, my CO2 will not have a lot of other impurities inside it. And I'm not going to be spending a lot of energy um, trying to extract my CO2. So this is another method. And then the third one, which is more common, is the post-combustion, which means that I have actually combusted my air with my fuel in my boiler, and then I generated my steam for electricity generation, but I've also captured my carbon dioxide with other things like nitrogen and water. And then um, we would then have to think of how do we separate nitrogen from CO2 ETC, but that's another um, part of the, uh, the discussion which I'm not covering today. So you see that there are different ways in which we try to capture it, but all of these are ways in which we can combine with existing things. Like if we have um, a power plant, we can include a stage where we um, extract CO2. If we have something like a cement plant, we can also include ways in which we can capture CO2, okay? Now, the other thing is, we could either utilize it, and Dr. Su has really talked about, you know, things like uh, methanol, um, ammonia, so even cement, he's, he has talked uh, a bit about that. So let me focus on the storage part of things. Now, in terms of storage, we need to be looking for what, what subsurface structures are porous enough to contain the amount of CO2 that we've captured and we want to put underneath the ground. We need to take into consideration that we are not causing more harm than good, such as where is our water table? Where do we have fresh water? We don't want, um, we don't want to be injecting CO2 into what will be fresh water, fresh water for the future. And then we need to consider what sites have enough um, things like porosity, permeability, um, you know, those characteristics that will enable us store this fluid um, this CO2 in the subsurface without affecting our nearby environment. We don't want the CO2 to come back to the surface after we've put it there in an uncontrolled manner, cause, um, cause poisoning. So we want to think of how can we ensure that we seal our CO2 beneath the surface. So there are, um, there, there are very, very um, you know, important steps to take in what we call the storage site selection for CO2 storage. And this is part of the things that um, I'm heavily involved with because we transferred knowledge from the oil and gas industry into this realm. Now, looking at CCS globally, um, and the reason why I'm sharing this is just for us to understand feasibilities. So CCS um, has been done for quite a while and there are different projects. So in terms of what we see in red are the ones that are currently in existence and the size of the circles are how big the project is. And along my timeline here, we are beginning to see how this is really growing and expanding and a lot of projects in place. Now, um, this is taking based off 2022 numbers. So I'm sure that by um, now this may have been updated, but this can just give you some idea of the kind of work that is going on. And this is just showing um, where most of these projects are. So. And in red, we have the ones that are in operation and in blue are the ones that are being um, in development. Now, another important thing that I just want to highlight here, um, let's start with the figures on the right. So here we have um, the number of facilities for large scale carbon capture and storage and what we have in operation, which we have about 26 of them, and then we have what is in construction, what is in advanced development and in early development stages. So you see that there's um, a lot of experience across the globe for CO2 capture and storage. We also look at it by region. And so we understand that 
we we are not alone if we need to start our projects there are people that we could always call on and i'm i'm very happy for the collaborations that nigeria is taking between the us between um uk europe in order to advance ourselves in ccs now what is what is um of interest to note and this is the reason why um i put that slide on the concentration is the amount of cost for first of a kind carbon capture and storage um, projects. So when you're doing it for the first time, okay? And we see that things like um, um, ammonia production, if we are associating a CCS project with it, it's usually um, low in terms of cost. Um, when we go to things like iron and steel, when we go to um, cement, it's, it's quite huge. So recall that with ammonia, we have high concentration of CO2. And so this significantly reduces the cost of the kind of project because we wouldn't spend a lot of finances and funds trying to separate and um, you know, just remove impurities, okay? So in, in, in a nutshell, CCS projects are quite expensive. And um, it's either we think of ways of how do we generate revenue for the amount of money that we're spending, or how do we get support funds? And what we, what, what we see across different, um, different um, countries, when you look at their policies and the regulatory frameworks, they talk about how the government has um, you know, set aside, appropriated some funds for these projects and the kind of um, tax incentives that are given. Um, for instance, in the US, they talk about the 4Q um, tax credit where for every um, ton of CO2 that is stored, no, every million ton of CO2 that is stored, you are given um, $50. Is that um, every ton of CO2 is $50, $50. So you can imagine the kind of incentive that is making people want to store CO2, okay? In terms of utilization, I wouldn't talk too much about it, but one key thing for us in Nigeria is we want to continue to produce our oil um, beneath the surface. Are there ways in which we can use enhanced oil recovery to improve you know, production of oil and keep producing oil while combining with things like um, carbon capture and utilization? So EOR is one means in which we can use CO2 to try to, to um, make improve our flow of fluids and recovery from our reservoirs. In terms of Nigeria, we um, look quickly at um, where the CO2 emissions are. The figures here are up to 2016. And then we have in blue for power, in black, this is things like um, cement. We have in green other industrial combustion, like um, the things like if we need to use it for ammonia and other um, industry things. We have in this orange color transport, but transportation sector is not a stationary source, which means we cannot go about every car and every vehicle trying to put a carbon capture facility. It is near, near impossible. So these are not our focus for um, carbon capture and storage. And then we have things like buildings. So usually the focus will be around the power industry, the things like cement industry, ammonia, and all mostly um, um, industrial sectors. Um, another thing I just want to show you is um, source to sink mapping, an example of what you do. So I'm just taking, for instance, where we have um, cement factories that will be generating CO2. And then we also have to think about where are possible locations for um, storage sites. This is just tentative, it's an uh, example. It's not um, a study that I'm trying to share here. And so you can see that what is critical is how do we match our source to sink? And then what I'm putting here is, so for instance, if we have a site, a source somewhere here in Lagos and we want to put um, a sink here, that is a place where we want to store, we need to connect it through something. And let's say we want to connect it to a pipeline We'll be looking at pipelines of about 100 miles or 160 kilometers. Um, you could go further depending on appropriate storage facilities for the volumes of CO2 we'll be generating. And it could go up to 250 miles or 400 kilometers. So now this is the kind of infrastructure that is needed to be able to support the CCS value chain. So for me, just to summarize, is, uh, is there a feasibility for CCS in Nigeria? Of course, I'll say yes. Dr. Osu has even shown us that um, the steps that are being taken, there are known projects worldwide. 
But what is key for us is to be able to adequately characterize and quantify. So to characterize our CO2 emissions by sources and to quantify them continually to know which, which sectors are emitting most of the CO2, what is the kind of purity and concentration in those sources. And so we know how to cite our projects. We do have reservoirs with good storage properties and this we can continue to study to understand you know, what type do we want to do it in what we call the saline aquifers, which are just water, water reservoirs or depleted gas reservoirs, which is reservoirs that we already know how their structures are. They previously contained gas or oil, and we want to use them now to store CO2. In terms of challenges is um, enabling pol policies and tax incentives, ETC, um, these are the things that are really going to help us to move forward. And again, I would lean on to Dr. Su's um, presentation that, you know, it's talking about the steps that are being taken towards policies and regulations, because these are key for um, ensuring that all stakeholders know what they need to be doing and are involved. And then the infrastructure and security is very important. We need a kind of infrastructure that will allow us to move from source to sink and how to ensure that we do not, um, there is no um, cutting of pipelines or um, vandalization of pipelines along the way because CO2 into the environment is just not good. And then funding, funding is very critical. As we can see, it is a very, very expensive project. In some cases, it may not be bringing early returns on investment or not in, no um, returns on investment. Now it is good for sustainability projects. It is also good as we understand the impact of um, emissions on our environment. So, you know, we, we, we just need funding. So that's um, something that is critical. And then local expertise. We haven't done CCS projects yet in Nigeria. So we may not have sufficient local expertise, but in terms of um, we could get people who have already done it to provide trainings, um, to keep building the capacity of people in Nigeria such that when our project starts, we're able to participate at different parts of the value chain. Now, what are the opportunities? There are skills and job opportunities. The whole process of setting up a carbon capture facility, um, transporting it, storing it involves a lot of skill sets, which could either be taken from existing industries or we begin to build um, and get people and train them on this. So there's a lot of opportunity to increase the skills across uh, all tiers and create job opportunities for Nigerians. There's also opportunities to carry out further research and curriculum updates. Now, other countries, other regions have done their own projects, but they have their peculiarities of the kind of systems that they have. We in Nigeria, we have different kinds of reservoirs. We have different kinds of um, systems, regulatory frameworks. So these are opportunities for us to improve on our own research and also update the curriculum such that students who are coming in can learn more about you know, greenhouse gas emissions and how to store and manage CO2. There's also opportunities for collaborations within the industry. So you can see, if you look at the whole value chain, we're starting from capture, transportation, storage, and these are different kinds of industries, but this is opportunity for different industries to co collaborate all for the good of Nigeria. And then there are also opportunities for CO2 utilization where we can generate some funds from revenue and even blue hydrogen, Dr. Osu talked about it. And so in terms of blue hydrogen, we are actually getting um, natural gas. We do what we call things like steam, steam reforming to produce hydrogen. But because we are producing hydrogen from something that will re release CO2, we then think of ways of capturing CO2 from this process and storing it. So when we now store the CO2 from the process, the hydrogen that we produce is called blue hydrogen. And so these are the kind of things that we want to be considering because when we go into the market and we want to play as Nigeria as producing um, hydrogen, the, the people that are buying hydrogen for us want to know that our hydrogen is either green or blue and blue hydrogen has more value than gray hydrogen, which is the one where we didn't um, attach CCS. So um, on this note, I will just say thank you for your time. And um, when it's time for the questions, I'm here to take questions and discuss further. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Rita. Thank you very much. We're running short of time right now. 
I'll move on to the next speaker, um, Dr. Mohamed Dahiru Aminu. He's a consultant in sustainability and climate change unit at PwC, at the famous PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, he was also assistant professor of petroleum chemistry at the American University of Nigeria in um, Adamawa. He earned a PhD in carbon capture and storage from Cranfield University. He also holds MSc in petroleum engineering and a BSc in geology degrees. His profile also reaches into the pitch of public commentary, where he of, often contributes to issues on Nigeria's economic and developmental challenges in leading online and traditional news outlets. He's a chartered geoscientist and a member of several professional societies. Dr. Muhammad Aminu, welcome, and uh, I'll leave the floor to you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have um, slides to present. I, I made this known to um, Amina Namadami, uh, so I guess you will um, understand. Um, so, uh, yeah, looking at CCS in Nigeria, feasibility challenges and opportunities, I think this is quite an interesting topic for me. Um, I would like to begin by saying that I am passionate about CCS in general, and I am happy to be given an opportunity like this to discuss CCS. Um, because of my background in geology, in petroleum engineering, um, at the time I did my PhD at Cranfield University, I focused mainly on, on the storage aspect of CCS, which is the last step in the CCS uh, value chain, that is after capture and transport. So uh, my bias is actually CO2 storage. Um, I still don't have much knowledge about CO2 capture, you know, um, because that to me is um, it, it's not where my, my, my bias is. So in addressing this topic of CCS in Nigeria, um, I will be talking mainly about um, why CCS matters, um, why CO2 takes precedence amongst the other greenhouse gases, um, what are the options for CO2 storage in general, and the options that are likely feasible in Nigeria, the context um, for CCS in Nigeria, of course, Dr. Victor has said something about this, and also the opportunities or the current state of development around CCS implementation in Nigeria, which is mainly on the, um, the current policies that are evolving you know, from the government side. Um, so why does CCS matter? I think that we can all agree that CCS is considered as the key strategy for decarbonizing the power sector as well as the industrial sector. And um, it is estimated, if I can remember, that um, CCS alone can contribute almost about 20% reduction in emissions by 2050. But if you don't do CCS, so at the exclusion of CCS, you can have, let's say, a 70% increase in the global cost of achieving you know, emission reduction targets. So um, when we say carbon capture and storage, we are, why are we always focusing on carbon dioxide, not the other greenhouse gases? For example, why not methane capture and storage? Why not um, nitrous oxide or, or um, water vapor carbon, uh, sorry, water vapor capture and storage, et cetera? I, I, I believe we focus on carbon dioxide because we all know that uh, climate change is primarily a problem of um, carbon dioxide. Um, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, um, the atmosphere has, um, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere has risen. Um, and um, the problem with CO2 is that it takes between 50, somewhere between 50 to 200 or 200 years, yeah, somewhere between 50 to 200 years um, for CO2 to be either absorbed by a sink or to take part in another chemical reaction. So what this means is that the CO2 that we have vented into the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution uh, may very much be around, the, uh, you know, with us in the atmosphere. Um, of course, methane, on the other hand, is many times more potent than CO2, but that's, you know, probably within the first 20 years of its being in the atmosphere, but not in the long term. So CO2 has a longer lasting effect, and that is why CO2 is the main culprit. Um, in terms of options for CO2 storage, there are many options for CO2 st st storage. Uh, we have um, the geological options, we have the sequestration options, the non-geological options. 
So I would like to draw the attention of um, everyone here to the difference between storage and sequestration. When we say CO2 storage, we are mainly limiting the conversation to geological storage, which are you know, storage in saline aquifers, storage in depleted oil and gas reservoirs, in unminable coal seams, in basaltic formations, um, hydrate storage of CO2 within the subsurface, and let's say um, CO2-based enhanced geothermal systems. When, but when we say sequestration, we are always um, involving both geological options as well as you know, other options which are not geological. And these are mainly deep ocean storage as well as mineral carbonation. So in the context of this discussion, um, I think that the most feasible options for us at the moment are storage in saline aquifers as well as storage in depleted oil and gas reservoirs, which are both geological CO2 storage options. Now, when you talk about storage in saline aquifers, um, what are the advantages? And um, what are also the advantages for storage in depleted oil and gas reservoirs? So storage in saline aquifers is advantageous over storage in depleted oil and gas reservoirs because we all know that saline aquifers are very widely distributed, you know, geographically speaking. And um, storage in depleted oil and gas reservoirs is advantageous over storage in saline aquifers because the depleted oil and gas reservoirs will mostly have been well studied before and during hydrocarbon exploration stage. You know, um, its storage capacity must have been um, investigated. The surface and underground facilities may be there. Um, injection wells and pipelines may already be existing. And um, you could have just made minor modifications, you know, as opposed to major installments, um, you know, when, when, when you talk about the saline aquifers. So um, you also have the, so somebody mentioned, um, Dr. Okorafo mentioned enhanced oil recovery. So when you do CCS or CO2 storage, you know, in depleted oil and gas reservoirs, or sometimes, you know, within the oil industry, you can do that, you know, considering that you have the benefit of enhanced oil recovery. So you can have more production, uh, which I guess there are some CCS projects in the world that, um, that were derived, you know, the motivation for that was derived from the need to do enhanced oil recovery. You know, you, ha you have the Snowvit project, you have this Sleipner project in the Norwegian North Sea, you have um, some projects in Canada. So in Nigeria, um, I think that saline aquifers as well as depleted oil and gas reservoirs are the two main options that we have. You know, um, we have six sedimentary basins in Nigeria, and I think that the, it, there are no much studies on these basins, save for, let's say, um, the Niger Delta. I think there are a couple of studies, you know, on, on the Niger Delta, not very exhaustive. So I believe we have, um, these basins and a detailed assessment of the Niger Delta suggests that it is suitable for geological storage. Um, the Niger Delta basin also has um, natural gas reserve, one of the largest in Africa and probably the world. And um, oil exploration and production in the Niger Delta has also caused um, enormous amount or significant amounts of, of CO2 being vented into the atmosphere. So I believe that CCS implementation will just utilize that gas that has been flared continuously, uh, maybe through CO2 EOR, or just to maintain um, reservoir pressure and enhance hydrocarbon production for, you know, for enhanced recovery, of course, as, as well as, you know, just storage in geological media, you know, um, that is for completely depleted oil and gas reservoirs. Now, to the best of my knowledge, like I have said, I don't think um, there have been exhaustive studies on, on the other basins. Um, so I think researchers should begin to look in that direction. Now, um, finally, the current state of development around CCS implementation in Nigeria. Perhaps we all know that um, Nigeria has recently agreed to reach net zero by 2060, given that our president has committed to net zero by um, at the COP you know, which was held in Glasgow in November 2021. Um, by 2060, we want to achieve net zero. So we might also be aware that um, immediately after the COP26, the president signed a climate change deal, which now makes it a climate change act. And um, in addition to my role as um, a PWC staff, 
um, in sustainability and climate change. I am also the climate change um, advisor, the key climate change expert or the technical advisor on climate change to the Honorable Minister of State for Environment. And um, part of my role is that I am on the technical working committee that is driving the implementation of the Climate Change Act. So um, this act is quite comprehensive and it provides for the establishment of a council, which is going to be called the National Council on Climate Change. And that council will drive the implementation of all climate change activities in Nigeria. So um, in addition to that, Nigeria also has an energy transition plan. And I think this is the first energy transition plan in Africa. You know, so that ETP or the energy transition plan uh, was recently approved by the Federal Executive Council, maybe about two weeks ago. Um, and it provides a roadmap for Nigeria to reach net zero by 2060. And so I think this is critical for um, the global climate transition. And so with our ETP now approved by government, it is believed that Nigeria will be able to lift about 100 million people out of poverty by driving economic growth across different sectors of the economy. And uh, we'll also be able to improve the access of modern energy to as much of the population as possible. And we'll also be able to manage the inevitable job loss. There will be like job loss in the long term in the oil and gas sector, which will be a result of the global dec decarbonization. So with respect to CCS, I think the ETP also recognizes the need for CCS technology deployment in Nigeria, particularly in the oil and gas sector, as well as in manufacturing sectors. So this means that the major oil companies in Nigeria will start CCS deployment. One company uh, which I know is very keen on deploying CCS in Nigeria is ExxonMobil, because anytime I log into LinkedIn, um, I usually see them sharing a lot of information about um, CCS. So I think ExxonMobil is very, very keen on CCS um, around the world. You know, that is not only Nigeria, but you know, in, in their operations around the world. So exactly a week ago, the World Bank and the IFC, which is International Finance, Finance Corporation, which is a member of the World Bank Group, has issued like a press statement uh, saying that they want to help Nigeria to pave the way for domestic carbon dioxide study. And I think this is what Dr. Victor mentioned. So I think so many things are in the pipeline. Um, I think that we are living in exciting times for climate action, and Nigeria is not taking the back seat. So um, yeah, there is a lot to say about CCS. And um, I want to end this um, uh, discussion. Uh, of course, I'll wait for your questions uh, by saying that you can read my paper on carbon dioxide storage. It is entitled A Review of Developments in Carbon Dioxide Storage. It was published in 2017 um, in Applied Energy. And I guess that paper will give you all the information you want on, on carbon dioxide storage. Um, it, is, it has been cited more than 300 times. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohamed Amin. Thank you very much. Um, well, we've, we've come to the end of the presentation by the presenters, and we move on to the question and answer section. Um, I know a lot of you guys have a lot of questions. Um, I would like to start. The question, um, how I would suggest this um, goes is, you would ask a question and then you pick out uh, one of the presenters to answer the question. So I presume that the question will be for a specific presenter. For example, Dr. Victor Osu, um, are you with me, Dr. Victor Osu? Hello? Yes, I'm with you, sorry, I'm Dr. with you. Like Dr. Victor Osu is um, into policy. That's what in the CCUS chain, your focus is policy. Dr. Rita Okorofa, Okoro Offa Afo and Dr. Mohamed specialized in geological storage and also um, CCS cap um, the capture process as well. So that is how I would suggest we go about the question and answer section. So ask a question and then pick out somebody that you feel will be most equipped to answer the question. So um, I would like to start. So Dr. Victor, also I have a question for you. You mentioned um, a World Bank funding for the CCUS project in Nigeria. Yes, I did, yes. Yes, um, 
is there so basically thinking of how banks operate if they give you uh, money they have a time frame so yeah. is that the same process with the world bank funding yeah, yeah. There's a time frame. To, um, is, is it time frame in terms of utilizing the money or what exactly? Yes, time frame, hello. Okay, time frame in terms of utilizing the money. And obviously, I'm sure there are conditions that um, we have to meet. Um, yeah, there are conditions we have to meet, but I just want to say that we've passed all that condition. Um, um, and the condition is very favorable to Nigeria. Um, um, in, in all contexts, uh, because it was really a, a hard bargaining from from our side, and also from some technical input that we had from um, local experts um, and to drive that process. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question I have is that I don't know why I keep hearing echoes, but the oil and gas sector we, all, we obviously focus a lot on that. Um, but as Nigeria talk about the transport sector in terms of um, greenhouse gas emissions, it's just an arbitrary question. Yeah. Yeah, of course, definitely. Uh, if you look at the NDC today, uh, the transport sector is one of the key platforms that we are looking at. And so that's what we call the CDR. Uh, that's carbon dioxide removal. So we are liaising with the United States um, to, to drive that process. And I think um, what um, Dr. Muni said about the non-geological part of it, it's where we are now looking at to see how we can start using CDR to drive those processes. And so transport sector is a very key area for us. And as, as as, as part of the CCUS or I mean, as part of the carbon methane capture also that um, Dr. Muni talked about, tra transportation is going to be very key um, for us too. Okay. Um, I just have one question for us, then I'm going to um, pass the listening to some, to because some of the participants also want to ask questions. So for Dr. Rita um, Okorofa, I don't know why I keep finding it hard to um, say it. Um, it's before. fine with Dr. Rita. Yeah, with Dr. Rita. So you yeah. mentioned um, CO2, um, CO2 can be reduced, um, can be used for cement, can be used for cement production. How yes. would that actually work? Because, you know, CO, CO2 is usually an, like what is emitted in CO2. Do you, do, you, do, you want, do you want us to start chemistry class here? No, it's not chemistry class. I just want, like, they just tell us because everybody here, uh, SPE, everybody kind of knows the basics. So cement, calcium, okay. carbonate. So is there like a reverse process that we can use CO2 to make the cement? Yeah, so there are certain, there are certain um, um, distance. Yes, so there are, if you have, um, there are certain minerals, if you have calcium in some places, yes. you are able to mix it with CO2 to form um, cement. Right. So cement as a word is, it covers um, the cement as we know it, it also covers things like CaCO3. Now, okay. if you, if, um, most people here, if you can check on what they call the carbs, carb fix project, it's one of the projects being done in Iceland where CO2 that is captured is made to react with rock and form a new mineral. So mm -hmm. these are all part of the ways in which you can just take CO2 to form something else and then you can use the minerals for something else. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, I have a question for Dr. Mohamed. You mentioned um, the, the, the energy transition plan which um, I think Dr. Victor is also part of, I, I assume, I'm just assuming that both of you work together in that issue, in that um, department. So the FEC, you said, created a department to, for the ETP to be implemented, which was two weeks ago, like you said. Is there an enforcing agency? Yeah, yeah. so um, I think to correct the, the misconception, if there is any, is that, um, you know, the ETP doesn't have anything on the creation of that agency, or, or rather the, the council. It's okay. not in the ETP. Um, what, what is um, here? So, so I think it is actually the Climate Change Act that specifies the need to have a council that will drive Nigeria's climate change ambition especially our need to achieve net zero by 2060. Now, um, this act provides for the establishment of the National Council on Climate Change, but the ETP is the step-by-step -step detail. You know, so the ETP gives you what you need to do um, in order to achieve net zero by 2060. But for me, um, that in itself is not very exhaustive. So there is the need probably for the government to review the, the ETP so that you can have like um, micro steps yeah. 
yeah. you know, toward moving into 2060. Because the ETP will be like, okay, by 20 so and so, you need to have so so amount of um, electric vehicles in Nigeria. So how do you get to that? So the ETC, the ETP in itself uh, may need to be reviewed, let's say the, by the Department of Climate Change at the Ministry of Environment. Uh, but to to answer your question directly, um, it is the climate, the, sorry, the Department of Climate Change that is driving this. And um, so the parent body is the Ministry of Environment. So the Minister of State for Environment, who is now in charge of the Ministry of Environment, is the one um, tasked with the responsibility of driving the implementation of the Climate Change Act, as well as the ETP, because she actually took the ETP to the Federal Executive Council for approval. Yeah, so everything is domiciled in the um, Ministry of Environment. But lest I forget, the Council on Climate Change has uh, the President and the Vice President as Chair and Vice Chair, as well as 11 ministers, I think, 11 ministers, you know, as well as the CBN Governor, the National Security Advisor, um, the representative of the Governor's Forum, um, who sit on that council, as well as, you know, other people there, you know, representatives of the youth, of the women, you know, of the disabled, etc. So it's, it's, it's a huge council. Okay. Thank you very much. That was answered um, the question. Um, I'd like to pass this on to the participants. Um, a lot of people have been raising up the hands. I think they have a lot of questions. So I'd like to start with Umar Adam. Um, you can unmute and ask a question. Uh, okay, uh, once again, uh, good evening. My name is uh, Omar Adam. Uh, it was really a wonderful uh, presentation and I was so excited to be here because uh, while well, I'm a computer science uh, PhD candidate uh, with some other software engineering uh, student, we are looking at uh, carbon absorption from the tech aspects. We don't really have a background on the uh, uh, how will I put it, uh, in the petroleum industry and uh, other aspects. So I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Victor. Uh, my question is that the whole funding for uh, carbon itself is not really uh, clear or the publicity is not coming in Nigeria because I'm hearing this for the first time. So I'm thinking since there are a group of students with the mindset of coming up with a startup that has to do with solving this very issue, there is need for competition from these very agencies and more publicity. Because our major challenge was funding in terms of infrastructure. We put this in place, but the cost, the amount is going to cost us is really huge. Right now we're at the ideation stage. If it is possible, we would like to pitch our idea to you. If there is any support we can get from the government. So that is from this uh, very uh, aspect. Then the second question is to Dr. Rita. We are looking at uh, collecting the carbon, transforming the carbon for agricultural purpose. Is it possible? If it is possible, what are we supposed to do? Because we are all tech students. We are looking at this from the tech uh, aspect. I'm a computer scientist. I have a software uh, engineering student. I have an electrical electronics student in my group. So who do you suggest we add to the team so that we have a very robust and solid team? that can go ahead because we're looking at absorbing those very carbon, uh, converting the carbon to something that can be used in the agricultural aspect. And we are looking at the Northern Nigeria as a start since the power is in agriculture. How can we get this carbon, use it in the Northern Nigeria? So um, input from all the speakers is highly welcome. Already we have a pitch deck, which I'm ready to share with all the speakers here so that we can get more input because like uh, you are the expert in this very aspect. Thank you so much. Okay. Should I respond? Okay, um, I'll, I'll start and I'll pass it over to um, Dr. Dr. Rita. So thank you very much for that question. So um, I'll be more than happy um, if you can send me your pitch and we can connect um, over next week. But one of the things that I want to also mention today is that um, I'm aware that there's a global clean tech innovation program that is coming up very soon um, under the Federal Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation that has been facilitated by UNEDO. So one of the key things is 
energy project uh, that might that might that might be very useful in this course. So maybe if we can catch up and discuss with your team, and then we can see how we can mainstream what you guys have um, towards that um, towards that program that's coming up. Is that okay with you? Yes. yes. Brilliant. Brilliant. So let, let's let's try and catch up. You have my details, right? Uh, no. Okay, maybe the maybe the organizers should share my email to you, and then you can just um, send send a mail to me, and then we can catch up. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Right, Doctor Rito, you have the floor. Sorry. Okay, I was on mute. So, um, in terms of using CO two, there is um something you can do with CO two when you react CO two with ammonia and you get um, a gas, you know, that um, you can use as fertilizer. So there's some, there's a kind of process to form um, ammonium carbamate. And in terms of the kind of people that you will need to work with, you need people who are into chemical engineering, for instance, people who have also had experience working with fertilizers and then um, people that have some chemi um, chemistry background as well. Um, that's that's what I would um, suggest. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Usman. Next person I would like to, next next thing I will pick um, Sunday Kanshio. Can you unmute and ask a question? Oh, all right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, that was a brilliant presentation from my my friend Minu. Uh, Victor and Rita, very good uh, presentation from the, the leading uh, people in the, this uh, uh, carbon capture uh, space. So my, my question goes to uh, Dr. Su uh, regarding the, the, the work he's doing at, uh, with, with the vice president uh, and his team. I, I, um, and is my my question specifically is, is regarding the the policy regarding uh, capture and transportation. Uh, I mean storage, as Rita said, uh, uh, storage is. Um, I mean no, not not Rita. I mean storage is is, is a lot of knowledge around storage. Uh, many geologists have worked uh, a lot of work around storage. Um, capture. Uh, I, I mean, coming from Cranfield University, there's so much work around uh, capture as well. The challenge is uh, transportation. Uh, so, in terms of policy, Doctor Osu, uh, what is a, uh, your team and federal government doing regarding uh, transportation? Because there, there's going to be a huge challenge around transportation, not just uh, because of insecurity, people, people cutting the pipelines, but also transporting uh, CO two. Because CO two uh, is has behaved differently from normal gas. Uh, at very high pressure, you have CO2 in dense phase, and then that becomes a challenge because you begin to see the, the viscosity of CO2 be, uh, uh, behaving uh, differently the, uh, uh, for normal gas that we know, and the, the density of CO2 also behaving differently. So uh, that then increased the cost of transportation, not just for the cost, the capital, the capex, but also the cost of transportation. So. Going forward, what is government strategy for transportation? Looking at the technical aspect and the security aspect. Well, thank, thank you me. very much. Um, okay, sorry. Thank you very much for that question. So, as I as I started off, um, I, I said we are starting that relationship with the World Bank to drive um, that process. So, there's uh, what we call the diagnostic and the scoping exercise that we are looking at. Now that is phased into four things, um, into four thematic area and transportation is part of it. We know the very big challenges of transportation and that's something that we can't say what we need to do now as at today because we need to look at that holistically. But one thing, one thing that we are doing that, I, that, that the IFC is doing, the IFC is um, going to support in terms of financial viability or investment and financial flow within that, within that space. Now, um, one, one, one thing that we are looking around is what we call the hub. Um, the hub, storage hub, will be very critical for us to minimize that kind of lengthy um, transportation, number one. Number two, 
the basins are also going to be very critical. So, for example, and I, I think I, I, I loved what um, Dr. Rita did in terms of showing us a, an example of a cement where it's far into Kad Kogi State. Am I correct? Yeah. And looking at how that transfer goes to a Niger basin. Now, the question is, um, do we have to build that transfer up to that? Or do we look at the mid Niger basin again as a potential? And I know in Mr. In, sorry, in Dr. Aminu's um, lovely journal, the best the best um, basin was was Niger Delta. Doesn't mean that other basin might not have potential. So it's I think it has to just do with um, what we see during our diagnostic period um, process, and then see if that if the financial can actually uh, make sense to do it within that locality and build a storage hub or look at it from that place down to the Niger Delta. And again, it's, it's a private sector stuff again. Private sectors will be, really be heavily involved. But as I said, uh, as uh, Richard, Dr. Richard also said, is that there needs to be an incentive for a private sector to say, okay, you know what? I'm going to undertake this process with you guys. I'm going to invest also into this process because one, for decarbonization, two, the climate change bill that that might that might tell um, industry to start looking at, um, you know, forcing them or well, not forcing them, but enforcing that standard. So everything has to do with that whole stakeholders relationship, both national expert, local experts coming together and the industry to say, okay, you know what, how do we drive this process together? What will be the cost? Do we look at um, um, having our storage at Niger Basin or do we drive it down to the Niger to the Niger Delta and what will be the cost and how will the cost be structured and what policy and regulations that we need to put into, into that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think you answered this question. Um, next person I would like to unmute and answer and ask a question is um, Dr. Kafayat Adeyemi. Um, good evening, everyone. Good evening. And um, thank you for the presentations. My question is to Dr. Amino. I'm wondering if um, you can share the energy transition plan with us. Um, the reason being that in the first place, I am a researcher in the University of Abuja, and I'm also a part of a team with Energy Commission working on um, Nigeria Energy Calculator 2050, a review of the 2015 calculator. And the essence of the calculator is to look at sustainable pathways of energy generation that will meet our um, energy demand. So like if we have an access to the energy transition plan for, for Nigeria. I think it will serve as a valuable input in what we're presently working on. And um, secondly, would you um, share the link to your article you made mention during your presentation? Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you um, very much, Dr. Kafaya, is it? Okay. okay. Yeah, so, um, so on the energy transition plan, um, I'm afraid um, we can share it now um, until probably in the next few weeks, you know, um, when we get the go ahead to share. Uh, the reason why it has been kept away from the public was um, we were waiting for the energy transition plan to be approved by the Federal Executive Council. Of course, it has been approved, but I think we need the Minister um, of State for Environment to give us the permission to make it public. So in, in due course, it will be made public. Um, if you are, um, yeah, it will be made public. So, so um, I know about the energy calculator. Being at the Ministry of Environment, I do meet um, the representatives of um, the Energy Commission of Nigeria, in fact, um, I just recently spoke to, I met and spoke also to um, the DG, uh, Professor Bala, who I understand attended Cranfield University. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think we are going to collaborate uh, with the Energy Commission of Nigeria uh, to, to drive the um, energy transition plan as well as the Climate Change Act because uh, they are a key stakeholder in this and that's the reason uh, the ministry is trying to collaborate with them. 
Um, so, so I, I will, you know, if, if we can keep in touch, I, I will share the energy transition plan when, when, when we get the permission to do that. Uh, for my article, I will share the link now. Um, now. I think it is now open access. Then it wasn't an open access article, but I, I think with time it has been made open access. So I'll just share the link here so that anyone who wants it can, can download. Yeah, um, thank you. And, and I wish you the best in your research at the University of Abuja. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, next person, let me see. We're running out of time. So not everybody that has their hands up is going to be able to ask a question. But um, I can be, I'm sorry, Isa Ibrahim's iPad, his name, his hand has been up for a very long time. Can you unmute and ask a question? Hello? Um, okay, he's not around. So I can be rookie. Olalikon, can you unmute and ask a question? Hello. 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 Now two Hello. people are unmuted. Good evening. Okay. Is Hello. There... Yes. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Uh, ladies and uh, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, permit me to make a remark. Uh, first, my name is Isa Ibrahim Modibu. I'm the chairman of the upstream petroleum regulatory commission and i've been following with uh, uh, great excitement the activities of the society of petroleum engineers and uh, the presentation today is quite exciting exciting in the sense that uh, both presenters uh, made a, a very impressive presentation which we need to reflect upon even though my friend uh, dr aminu He's saying that uh, he's not in a position to share uh, the uh, national plan on energy. First, let's agree on the fact that uh, globally, the energy architecture is changing as an, at an unpredictable uh, uh, sequence, such that on our own part here in Nigeria, and other parts of the world, there is the necessity for us to study very carefully and very creatively how we can try as much as possible to redirect our energy uh, sector by keying it into the national economy. Of course, there are a lot of possibilities and opportunities. These possibilities and opportunities cannot be attained until we sit and reflect very creatively. Uh, I'm impressed with the lady gentlemen that did the presentation and also those who participated. And I believe there is hope uh, uh, in regard to how best we can redefine our energy sector. The energy sector is not simply uh, uh, reducing it only to the petroleum, no, but we can do it in a larger scale. Uh, I'm happy Dr. Aminu spoke about uh, uh, research on the basins, uh, the, the, the Petroleum Industry Act, for instance, has created a very big opportunity for Pluto to understand that there is effort and necessity for us to create additional space within the industry. And at the same time, if we look at the Petroleum Industry Act carefully, it is a route, a pathway that will help in the democratization of access to wealth. If you don't democratize access to wealth by whatever means, by whatever phenomenon and structure, you know, definitely will have a lot of problems. This is a great country, a country of great opportunities. These opportunities are not attainable until we are able to use ideas because ideas are tools and means of driving nations to great prosperity. It has happened in history. The Japanese did it. The Chinese followed suit. And I believe Nigeria is in a position to do it even much better. I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to participate. Uh, I look forward on how best we can collaborate and create synergy amongst us for the common benefit of our nation and its people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you guys have anything to say? Um, also, we've also run out of time. Um, We'll just ask one more question. Um, I would like to ask the speakers if you guys have uh, more time to take more questions. 
because the time is actually it's actually six thirty right now, so the event should be coming to so, an end. Um, I'm available to take to answer more questions if people have any directed at me at least for the next five five to ten minutes. Okay. Um, same here too. Five ten minutes. Okay, yeah. Five, ten minutes. So we have somebody here who is the he's a policymaker with the Ministry of Petroleum Resources. And one time was technical assistant on natural gas to the Minister of Petroleum Resources and group general manager of NMPC. Um, his name is Justice Derefaka. Um, sorry, Justice Derefaka, can you unmute and ask a question? Hello, good, good evening, everyone. Please, I'm not general manager. I don't know. You want to give me a new job? Oh, no, no. It was, they say technical assistant and, and the. Okay, my name is Justice. Just, just leave it at just the river. I work with the Horror Minister of State Petrol Resources. Um, thank you very much, SP Abuja, as always. Thank you for the chairperson for this good um, initiative. And thank you to all the speakers. I think I've, I have met one, I've e-met one, and I've not met one of them. Now, um, the Minister of Petroleum Resources, of course, the petroleum industry is key to all of these about the CCU, given that CCUS, of course, technologies are uh, <clears throat> critical uh, for putting energy systems around the world on a sustainable path, that is a given. Now, despite the importance of this technology for achieving clean energy transitions, deployment has been slow to take off. There are only around, off the top of my head, if I can remember, I think about 20 commercial CCUS operations uh, worldwide. But the good thing is the, the momentum is building up and that's why we're having this conversation. And that's what Victor is doing, what he's doing in the office, office of the vice president. But I have a question and this question is not uh, uh, is for the audience to benefit from. Like I told uh, Victor the other time, uh, I'm writing an article on the CUS and how, and it's uh, now it fits into the wider uh, uh, Nigerian society. So my question is this, uh, to all the three speakers, and I will appreciate your how you respond to uh, what I'm going to ask you. It's been cited as CCUS um, is being too expensive and unable to compete with wind and solar electricity, given their, uh, if you like, spectacular falling costs over the last decade, while climate policies, including carbon pricing, which is a big problem, like you and I know, are not yet strong enough to make CCUS economically uh, uh, attractive. So um, my question is, uh, how do you react to that? Given the fact, again, given the fact that the idea that CCUS is high, to me, ignores the bigger picture. How do you respond to that, speakers? So let me start, first of all, by giving an analogy. Sometime in France, they had, um, um, a system where there was poop all over the surface. And it was only until they decided to create the um, WC would they see an improvement in that. So you can imagine a city where there was a lot of stench. Um, they had to get to that point where they saw that they had to, it had to stop. Something had to be done for things to change. But this was very, very um, long time ago. The situation we face now with um, the environment, um, I'm a mother and I think about the future. I think of the future for my children and my grandchildren. What's happening to the climate? Would we continue to fight um, things like um, earthquakes, um, hurricanes? you know, all these things. So I, I, I think about it and if there's a way we can mitigate negative impact on our environment as a whole, because whatever is happening in one place, it might look like it's one off, like, oh, this thing is just happening in the US, it's happening only in Asia, but it's cutting across. We are global now. So the question for me is, um, when we think about what is the impact, what is the cost of a life? What is the cost of, you know, you know, keeping making the environment sustainable for our children and our children's children, then I don't see why we shouldn't take the steps towards trying to resolve um, this problem. CCUS, CCS is very expensive. It's very expensive because we are not even seeing any returns, but it has benefits, which in some cases cannot be quantified if we are able to actually uh, put ourselves back in a path 
where the global um, warming is not going to be increasing. So that's um, the, the well, that's what I will answer in regards to that. Thank you, and I hope it's helpful for the audience as well. All right. Thank you, Dr. Rita, and um, Justice. Thanks also for that question. Um, so. Nigeria, typically what we are doing now is this. We're seeing a lot of, we're seeing a lot of all these gaps and expenses uh, concerning CCUS. And, and that is all the things being taken into account during, um, um, in the cost of the project. So for example, we're not just coming in to say we want to start CCUS and then start bringing technicality and everything. No, but there's going to be a deep dive diagnostics and scoping exercise that's going to take almost 18 months. I just, I just want to put that into the mix. So it's not a six month thing and that's it. It's going to take 18 months. And if you, if you, my slide said one, th one key thing is the public acceptance and stakeholders engagement. And that is going to be the major, major underpinning of this, um, of, of this project. Now, secondly, there's what we call the investment and financial flow that, that we've actually done back then in the Ministry of Environment. So we're going to use that basis, that methodology, that investment financial flow methodology and plunge it into the CCUS program. And I did mention that we will want to look at the most um, competitive costs for deploying the CCUS, but in such a way that it is private sector led. Now, a lot of guys, a lot of a lot of you down here will not will, 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 will see that the oil and gas companies will be ready to finance such things because if you look at the exploration and production, they, they, they put in a lot of billions into that. Now, for them to keep going, they have a mandate to make sure they they deal with decarbonization, and CCUS is one of the quickest pathway for them to do that. So the financial may not be is not going to be a problem, but rather is the incentive that you put in place for them to be able to commit a lot of uh, what do you call it a lot of uh, investment into that. For example, carbon in uh, carbon pricing is a major thing that we are looking at to support tax uh, um, tax holidays etc. If we build that regulatory framework that protects the private sectors and ensures that the private sectors will reap something out of it, and, and mind you, that is why storage should not be the focus alone. Because when you keep saying storage, and, and my and, and my and, and Dr. Rita said it, there's nothing. You've just put it on the ground and that's it. But when you start thinking about utilization, the economic value, and that is where Nigeria is is going to be really, really a step ahead. Now we are looking not just on that story, but looking at the utilization. And once we can actually have that frame of driving utilization, for example, hydrogen, ammonia, there are, there are countries out there in the world that are ready to buy ammonia in large quantity. And I think about, just think about that export if we do that and what comes into the country. So you, you start understanding the fact that if we're able to structure the investment and financial flow amongst public sector, private sectors, and also even uh, what they call it, research institutions and innovation, you will understand that, you will understand that there is great deal. Yes, the expensive might be at the beginning, but it starts coming down. And by the time we bring in the economic value along the value chain, I think the investment is not, is not going to be a problem anymore. People will start looking at CCUS as a key um, pathway and an economic value technology that drives social economic development in the country. Dr. Mami, do you have any? Okay, so, um, yeah, thank you. So I agree um, with Dr. Victor that um, the two main constraints or probably the two constraints at the top of all the constraints on CCS or CCUS is, you know, public acceptance of the technology and um, finance, you know, so what is the cost of CCUS? So I remember when I started my PhD in 2015, um, I was excited that there would be two CCS projects in the, US, uh, in the UK. Um, I remember there were Peterhead project as well as um, White Rose projects. But along the line, the British government said they couldn't fund these projects because I think, if I remember clearly, um, it would cost them about a billion dollars, sorry, a billion pounds. And um, they were not ready to sink in that amount of money um, for those projects. 
But the question is this, um, for a country like the United Kingdom, where the Industrial Revolution started, um, you know, so, so the whole issue of um, polluting the atmosphere with carbon dioxide and other greenhouse start, uh, gases started there, um, it was expected that, um, you know, they will take the leading position, you know, in, in, in climate change mitigation. Um, you know, that being said, I think that um, with time, these will not be an issue. Um, you know, part of the outcomes of COP26 is that there will be financing. In fact, developed countries uh, will mobilize funds for the developing countries um, in climate change mitigation, adaptation, et cetera. So, so I think that um, it's a matter of time um, that these will no longer be you know, much of an issue because when you weigh these problems, like Dr. Rita is saying, you know, when you weigh you know, the cost of not you know, doing this vis-a-vis -vis the cost of doing it, you know, what do you stand to gain? Um, so, so I think that um, another thing is taxation, you know, so I, I know that Snowbit and Sleipner projects in the Norwegian North Sea uh, were not really keen on storing carbon dioxide, but the motivation to store carbon dioxide was derived from the fact that for every ton of CO2 that they flare, there is an amount of money that they have to pay. So I think when governments make policies that um, you know, incentivizes the operators you know, to, to follow the path of sustainable decarbonization, um, I think this will you know, be able to solve some of these, these problems. So, so I think policy is important here. Thank you. Hello? Seems like I can't hear anyone. Hi, is our host oh, still here? Sorry, I was muted. I was muted. Oh, okay. So I, I was saying that um, if anybody has questions, again, they should just leave it in the chat box and I'll give it to the speakers and they will answer whenever they have a free time. And also please leave your email address and I'll attach your, I will attach your email address to the question asked and we'll proceed from there. I would like to leave um, everything to Victor and Anoche now to give the closing remarks. And yes. Hello, Victor and Anoche, are you there? He doesn't seem to be there. Hello? No closing. Hello, Apan. Okay, okay. Uh -huh. I just had a little a little break in network connection. I believe you're hearing me, right? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so thank you. Thank you so much for the amazing presentation. Thank you so much for to the amazing speakers. You'll agree with me that our moderator, Dr. Kalechi, did an amazing job. Please, can we give him a virtual round of applause? Thank you so much, Dr. Kalechi. Thank you. Thank you so much. And just before we wrap up to the very next angle, we'd we'll love to quickly have a remark by one of our outstanding professors who is here present. We would like to hear from the professor of oceanography and the blue economy, an NUC distinguished scholar in diaspora in energy climate change. Professor Chidi Igbesa, please, we like before we comment and wrap up the session. Professor Chilibe. Uh, thank you for the honor to say a few words. Um, in reality, there's very little to add because it's okay. been a very illuminating uh, set of presentations. So bravo to the speakers. We look forward to working with you. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our speakers. 
So we move and switch gears right now. I've had a lot of chats in the inbox. A lot of people DMing me, asking me that they would love to be part of SP Abuja section. I would like to say that this is the opportunity to join. Of course, being a part of SPE, you would enjoy... several professional member benefits, one of such books and subscriptions, library, and of course, subscriptions to the Journal of Petroleum Technology. So many benefits of being a member of the SP. So we are asking that if you want to be a member, it's for new membership, it costs 29 thousand naira and for renewal it costs 22 hour membership chair dr ikechiko kafo the number is on screen you can take a screenshot and copy the number and message in the Ubuja section of technical sessions are streamed live on youtube so you can visit our youtube page at section 119 and you'll see a past documentary of course <clears throat> inquiries send message to us on instagram facebook linkedin and of course would we'll be most excited to you of course after about two hours of an engaging lecture I'd like to have a closing remark and what happens to this game engineer victor onoche can you meet your mic okay um thank you very much akban so uh I want to believe that um, you all will agree with me that it has been an interesting session so far. Um, so on behalf of the session chair, Madam Amina Damadami of SP Abuja session and uh, the board and the entire members of SP Abuja, I want to say a very big thank you for uh, honoring our invitation. Our panelists, Dr. Victor Osu, Dr. Rita Okorafo, our own Dr. Rita, and then uh, to Dr. Mohammed Aminu, say a very big thank you. Um, and also to Dr. Um, Kelachi Omi here, our moderator, thank you for doing a wonderful job. To all our participants, thank you for joining us. Um, SP Abuja will always bring you exciting, um, insightful events. Um, I also want to use this opportunity to inform us that in the month of March, we also have an interesting um, event coming up. So just watch out. Um, we, we, we are always here to, you know, to add value to our professionals and to our members. Just like Akpa said, kindly join us if you are within the Abuja session, or even if you are not in Abuja and uh, you want to join. Um, the I'm sure he will share the um, the information on how to join. So thank you everyone for joining, and uh, if you are in Nigeria, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for programs today. And to round up the event, very distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we kindly request that you kindly turn on your video camera so that we can take a group photograph. Can you turn on your video camera? Oh my God. Can Please. You Can you turn on your video camera?
Akpan, are you there? I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, I was asking questions. Okay, I was like, we should kindly turn on our video cameras for a quick video shot for documentary purposes. Okay. So when I say SPE, we say oil and gas. SPE. Oil, oil and gas. Oil and gas. Okay, with your thumbs up, your thumbs up, please. Your thumbs up, please. Your thumbs Both up, hands. please. Both hands. <laughs> okay. Both thumbs. Just one, just one. Okay, just one. So SPE. Oil and, Oil and, Oil and gas. gas. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for participating. So for the next five minutes, we'll permit that we can interact and network. Yeah. And after that, we we'll would end the meeting. So five minutes networking, you're permitted. Thank you. Thank you very much again to everyone. Thank you so, so much. It was really a very interesting program. I didn't want it to end. <laughs> huh. mm -hmm. You can unmute your mic, participants now. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening, dear respecters, uh, teachers, and professional. Uh, my name is Rocky Bakonbi. I'm a foreign level geology student of Federal University of Technology, Mina. So I dropped a question in the chat box, which has not been responded to. So uh, my question is that uh, for, for an undergraduate student, what are the potential in CCUS for us? And how can we also get engaged in the research into CCUS? Thank you so much. I don't know if anybody can see my screen. I'm sharing pictures of our CNG bus made by Tracy Steco Group, Austrian Technologies, Nigeria. And um, this bus runs on 100% natural gas. Compressed natural gas? Yes, compressed natural gas. We drove this bus all the way from Lagos to Abuja on a budget of um, less than 50,000. Our, our current um, estimate of our CNG was about 49,700 or so, but approximately 50,000. So we know we could affect the, the public sector with the introduction of this, um, this, um, these buses and um, the forest scarcity is a classic example why we need to quickly shift our focus from um, diesel and yeah, petrol yes. public transportation to gas powered um, mass public transportation. The facts show it, you get um, enough, enough cost savings. We estimate the cost savings of uh, approximately uh, $25,000 for fleet managers once they convert to annual savings though, when you convert to, to CNG powered um, transport solutions. Are you talking about per vehicle? Per vehicle, yes. That's impressive. That's per vehicle. The current uh, rate of diesel is um, 450. 450 naira per liter. And um, in, um, in Lagos, Nipco sold to us at um, 125 Naira per cubic meter. We are buying CNG at a slightly higher price of uh, 145 here in, um, here in um, Abuja. And um, apart from the slight difference, but maybe transportation or anything, it's, um, it's the best bet for now.